Our webinar training norms for today, we ask that you minimize your outside distractions. Please be attentive and participate. Notify the presenter if you are having technical difficulties by raising your hand. In this case, with today's WebEx, if you'll just send me a um, note in the chat bar and use the chat or question and answers on your dashboard to answer questions. And since I'm alone today, if you'll just use the chat bar for all of our communication, that'll work great. Also, um, in case you become unmuted, just mute your microphone and video, of course, is not needed. A follow-up email is scheduled for 24 to 48 hours after the end of the webinar. Within this follow-up email, you'll receive a NISIS feedback survey, and when that is completed, uh, you'll receive a certificate of completion. You'll also receive a link to a recording of this webinar and all resources discussed during our time together today, and any answers to questions remaining from the webinar or any questions that might be submitted afterwards. And if I happen to miss a question in the chat, I try to review that as well, and I'll try to send any responses that I may have, um, or questions and responses that I may have missed. So for our agenda today, we will be looking at the post-observation conferences and always remembering that the goal of the entire evaluation process is growth. We will look at the pre-conference. We'll take a look at the observation, understanding the multi-purpose rubric, marking the rubric accurately during observations. Then we'll move into the feedback component of the post-observation conferences. We'll take a look at low inference data using the language of the rubric, and also take a look at some tools and resources before we wrap up our webinar for today. So to begin, the North Carolina Department of Public Instruction stands firmly that the educator evaluation is about growth and improvement of teacher practices. Too often, the evaluation process is viewed as a gotcha or a way to get rid of a teacher. This is not the purpose of the North Carolina evaluation. The teacher evaluation policy states that the intended purpose of the North Carolina teacher evaluation process is to assess the teacher's performance in relation to the North Carolina professional teaching standards and to design a plan for professional growth. It doesn't say for those doing poorly. It doesn't say for those doing well. What this policy means is that we are looking for growth for every teacher. That is the goal. The North Carolina Teacher Evaluation Process Manual is your best resource for evaluating teachers. Throughout the presentation, I will identify page numbers from the manual where information may be found. The manual uh, was linked or will be linked in the webinar resources today, uh, and the presentation is linked in the chat uh, in case you need that. And all of the links and resources will um, also be included in the follow up email. So I don't want you to worry about trying to get these links and um, get those bookmarked. We'll make sure that you get those. And also, I will show you where all of the resources are housed on our NISIS Google site. So here we see, and this is, should be a familiar site, this is the teacher evaluation process one pager. Um, it can be found on page 21 of the process manual. And this resource allows you to see the four step process in its entirety. Uh, notice that step one begins in green on the top left and circles around clockwise. Our main focus for today will be on component six, the post-observation conference, which says the principal shall conduct the post-observation conference no later than 10 school days after each formal observation. And just to begin, I'll just go ahead and make this statement that if for some reason as a principal or assistant principal or someone who is conducting an observation, if you for whatever reason, if you have not been able to have that post-observation conference within the 10 days, please do another observation. Um, 
And that's just not because that's policy. It is policy, but because it's the right thing to do. Any feedback that you would provide to a teacher after 10 days has passed is really not relevant uh, and would not support the true authentic growth of the teacher. So remember that uh, the sooner you can have the feedback conversation, the post-observation conversation, the better. Also, the purpose of the post-observation conference is to discuss and document strengths and weaknesses on the rubric. So to ensure we have a post-observation conference that is beneficial to the teacher and promotes growth, we must ensure an accurate and reliable pre-observation and observation as well. So on the screen, you see a red box around components four, the pre-observation conference, component five, the observation, along with component six, the post-observation conference. So let's focus in on component four. The goal of the pre-observation conference is to prepare the principal for the observation. So before the first formal observation, the principal meets with the teacher to discuss three things. First, the self-assessment that was just completed by the teacher, the professional growth plan, and a written description of the lesson to be observed. Some principals or districts may provide a guiding document for the lesson description. Um, this would be a school or local decision. This is not mandated within the evaluation process, but it does happen and sometimes that is a good guidance tool, a good a template uh, can serve as a good guidance tool um, to lead the conversation between, between the principal and the teacher about what that um, observable lesson may need to include or what it may need to look like. But let's discuss each of these components that we're looking to um, talk about during the pre-observation conference. So first, let's look at the self-assessment. The self-assessment should be a personal reflection about one's professional practice to identify those strengths and areas for improvement. A teacher's self-assessment should be completed without input from others. So think about when you uh, are asking your teachers to complete their self-assessment, you know, asking them to do that in a group setting, try to avoid that. You really want to provide them maybe a few days to get it completed or weeks or some type of timeline where they do have that privacy to find. Um, the purpose of the self-assessment are to identify performance, performance expectations, to, discuss, to guide discussions about goals, um, setting and professional development, program needs, and to provide input to the final ratings. But the self-assessment itself is a tool to review, and it may change throughout the year. Teachers may choose to share their self-assessment with their principals, or teachers may choose not to share their self-assessment. So now let's talk about the teacher that chooses not to share their self-assessment. The pre-observation conference should still include a conversation about the teacher's self-assessment, including areas that they identified as strengths and areas identified as weaknesses. So just because they don't share the document with you doesn't mean that you don't sh share the information that they have on the document. You still want to talk about those areas that they've identified for improvement and those areas that they've identified as strengths that they bring to the classroom. So remember that, whether they share it or not. So next is the professional growth plan. And let me stop there and check the chat just to make sure I don't have any questions. And I do have. Okay. When we talk about growth, are we talking about growth over time or just growth from the beginning of the current observation cycle? Um, when we're talking about the evaluation process, we're talking about an annual event. And I would like to think that um, through relationship building and the longevity of teachers, we know the longer they're at a school and the stronger those relationships are, the more dug in they are to the culture. We, we know uh, the more bountiful, if you will, the growth can be. Um, but we are, when we're talking about the evaluation process, we are just talking about an annual event. So if that provides clarification.
Okay. So now, okay, let's get back and let's now talk about the next component, which is the professional growth plan. The teacher's PDP goals should be informed by the teacher's self-assessment and the summative evaluation from the previous year. So using the data from the self-assessment and the summative evaluation data from the previous year, weaknesses are identified and goals for improvement are developed for the PDP. So now let's take a look at the different types of PDPs. And I'm not going to dig way into this chart. I just want you to know that it's here and that there's three different types of PDPs, the individual, the monitored, and the directed. All new teachers and teachers who are rated at least proficient on the standards and the at the end of the year on the teacher summary rating form, that's an individual PDP. You develop your own goals. The monitored PDP, that's for teachers who are rated developing on one or more standards on the teacher summary rating form from the previous year. They're on a monitored PDP. They develop their goals in a collaborative um, way with their administrators. The directed PDP, that's for teachers that were rated not demonstrated on the uh, summary rating form or developing on one or more standards on the summary rating form for two sequential years. And in that case, with the directed PDP, the administrator uh, sets the goals for the teacher uh, for their PDP, and those goals are based on prior observations and documentation uh, that has been collected by the administrator. So just, just some clarification there. So back to the pre-conference, uh, we're looking at the third component now, which is the written description of the lesson to be observed. Again, that's our third discussion topic. So this is a chance for the teacher to really showcase their teaching practices. And so um, at this point in the pre-conference, this is where, if at all possible, from the administrator's perspective, to let the teacher talk their way through their lesson and to really give you insight into things that they have identified as um, important and that will be important for you to truly get uh, true insight into their lesson. So as a principal, you should know about the culture of the class and you should be made aware of patterns and behaviors that may exist. Teachers should show um, how they're being proactive when planning this lesson to ensure that their student success. Um, so the more that you are prepared for the class and the lesson, the more that you can appreciate it. And so that's a really good way um, to communicate your goal to the teacher, that the more information they can prepare you during the pre-observation conference, um, the more data, additional data, you're going to be able to gather. Um, based on what you already know. So some principals, again, uh, may provide questions in addition to the template um, for the teacher to answer for the pre-conference, um, or again, just an outline for their conversation. Um, some principals or assistant principals may ask for the lesson plan, um, or at least give that as an option to provide the lesson plan. But it's important to remember that the teacher should be leading this conversation to prepare the principal for the observation. So now let's look at component five, the observation. Technically, this is when an evaluator checks the descriptors um, in the rubric while watching the lesson. And there's two types of observations. There's the formal observation and there's the informal observation. And it's very simple to know the difference. Formal observations last for 45 minutes or the entire class period. And an informal observation should last at least 20 minutes. So note this, and I have it in red over to the side. A post-conference is not required, but can be requested by the teacher for your informal observations. So in other words, only formal observations require a post-observation conference. Only your formal observations, only your full observations, formal observations require a post-observation conference. So informals do not. And so we're going to look at what that really means in a minute because sometimes 
I'm not sure that principals realize how detached that can make them from um, some of the instruction that's going on in their building. So uh, teachers with less than three years employment will be on the comprehensive evaluation si uh, cycle. And we know that consists of three formal observations uh, from the principal or designee and a formal observation from the peer. So that's four um, total formal observations. And then teachers with more than three years employment will be on the standard or abbreviated cycle. The standard requires three observations. Only one of those is required to be uh, formal and the others you can choose between formal and informal and then uh, two observations for the abbreviated cycle, uh, two observations on standards one and four. And let's take a, a better look at that for understanding on this chart. So this is just a, it's, it's uh, easier to understand if you're a chart person. Um, this over to the left side, this list the cycles, the different cycles, comprehensive, standard, and abbreviated, and then the requirements for each of the cycle um, out there here. So what I decided to do is just to identify with the little red dots when we have, since we're talking about post-observation conferences today, when you have the post-observation conference. So if we're looking through the comprehensive cycle, for our teachers with less than three years, well, we have four different opportunities to provide that feedback in a post-observation conference within the evaluation cycle. And if we have teachers that with more than three years that are on the standard cycle, um, and that's usually on the year that they're doing their license renewal, then they have a one formal observation with a post-observation um, conference. And then usually their other two additional observations are informal. So they have some, they have those other short 20 minute observations, but there's no post-observation conference required. So a teacher again can request that, or the principal can request it if they feel like it's, it's um, necessary, but it's not required. But what gives me pause is for those teachers that are not in their license renewal year and they're on the abbreviated cycle, that means that at no time during the year is there really an opportunity for you to have that instructional conversation, that feedback conversation with the teacher because um, you're not having the type of conversation, you're not having the type of observation. Um, to where it's required. You're just having these abbreviated informal observations on standards one and four. And so I just want you to take that in consideration, especially for new principals in a building to get to know your um, teachers, at least consider having everyone, whether they're in their renewal cycle or not, it is up to you. You can put everyone on a standard cycle um, just so that you get to know your teachers. And it's not about, um, a gotcha, like I said before, or about being intrusive into their classrooms. It's really about getting to know them and um, getting to know their, their strengths and weaknesses and being an instructional leader in your building. So I think I had another question. I'll pause here and check. Okay. An abbreviated cycle says it can be formal or informal. Is that correct? Yes. No. Uh, where do you? Yes, an abbreviated cycle can be. Um, let's go back. Yes. Mm -hmm. And the only difference there, it's the abbreviated is still on just standards one and four, but can be formal or informal. Yes, that's great. Mm -hmm. So you would have the opportunity to have, um, you would always have the opportunity to have that post observation conference, but again, you would be limited to just talking about standards one and four. I guess that just to me would limit, be even more limiting. Mm -hmm. 
And yes, that's correct. Yes, formal or informal. Let's see if there's any other questions. Mm -hmm. At what stage is it a standard cycle? A teacher goes on a standard cycle um, with more or three years employment. They're on any cycle, which so they would leave the comprehensive cycle and they could they would be on the standard cycle. So right here in the category of teachers, less than three years employment, you're on a comprehensive cycle. More than three years employment, you're on any cycle. And if we go back to the chart here, and this is this is policy. This chart is even included in our policy now. And the the um, the manual is um, a part of our um, policy procedures manual. So you can follow this, but um, it's also in this chart, the teacher evaluation process chart. Teachers with more than three years um, are on a standard or abbreviated evaluation cycle. And they could be put back on, a teacher with more than three years could be put back on a comprehensive evaluation cycle as well. That is an option as well. But when we, I guess the reason why it's like this is because that um, we know if you have less than three years, you are going to be assigned to a comprehensive evaluation cycle. So that's why it's um, the way it is here in the chart. For clarification. Okay, let's see if there's any more question. At what stage is the standard cycle? Did I answer that question enough that at what stage is the standard cycle? That's when you have more than three years, that's an option. The standard cycle is after you have more than three years employment. And at the bottom of this slide is a link to this comparison chart. Okay. Okay. Thank you for asking. Um, Clarifying questions. So now let's um, move on to what um, a better understanding of the NISA's rubric, that, which is the tool that we use to document information um, for the observation. And I just included a slide here of the NISA's rubric and what it looks um, like. And just to point out over here to the left side where you have um, this is observation and whether there's a check here or not. And that just means whether it's probable that you may see it within your time that you're spending in a classroom. Um, you may or may not. Does that mean that's all you need to look for during that classroom observation? It is not, but that just means that it is probable or it could be seen within that time. But our um, rubric um, has been. Um, complicated for some at times because it is a multi-purpose rubric. The five professional teaching standards are organized in this multi-purpose rubric that is used throughout the evaluation process. So throughout the year, the same rubric is used for different purposes. First, the, the teachers use the rubric to do a self-assessment. And you see there, I put the one. And then for observations, the rubric serves as a tool for providing formative feedback and as a data container within the online tool for the principal to collect and inventory the teacher's actions and behaviors throughout the year. And then at the end of the year, the rubric is used again as a tool to provide final ratings on the summary rating form, which serve as the summative evaluation of the teacher's practice throughout the year. So this, again, rem reminding you that this is an annual event and that teachers are only evaluated one time during the year. And they feel like that every time that there's an observation that they are being rated because we use the same rubric that has the rating categories listed. Let me go back here. So it has these 
rating categories listed the same on all the, on the rubric. And we use the same rubric for the self-assessment, the observations, and the summative evaluation. But we shouldn't be discussing ratings during our observations because no one observation should inform your ratings. Your ratings, you should get, you are rated at the end of the year after all of the data from the multiple observations have been collected. So anyway, we have a multiple purpose rubric that can be confusing sometimes, but our state board felt um, strongly on the philosophy that the same tool be used um, for the multiple purposes. So it's also um, important to understand the element context and rating levels to mark the rubric co co correctly. It's crucial to read the element description. Understanding the element provides context for the descriptors that are listed below. So this element description should be the lens you use to interpret the descriptors within the rubric. So it's so important to always read what's the definition that's above because it creates the context for these descriptors. So while we do not rate teachers during observations, like I just said, we can still use the rating categories, these categories, located at the top of the rubric columns to better understand the rubric. Approximately 90% of the rubric falls into a pattern of progressive development of knowledge, action, interaction, and extension. So as you see on the rubric, descriptors under the developing rating category are relative to the knowledge of the teacher. Do you know it? Proficient descriptors relate to the actions. Do you show it? Accomplished is about interaction. Is it visible in the actions of your students? And for the distinguished column to the right side, the descriptor relates to the extension. Is it visible beyond the instructional space of your classroom? So spend some time understanding the rubric, looking for patterns of progression along with areas that seem isolated. And also remember to use the questions document that I'm going to share with you a little bit later for clarification to really use the language of the rubric when you're having your, your feedback conversations. So also, I feel like that this slide in itself would be a great talking point during a curriculum meeting or a PLC meeting just to discuss how, um, especially for 4A, teachers know the way in which learning takes place and this progression um, of, across the rubric. So let's take, um, let's just take a look at this first one. Understands development levels of students and recognizes the need to differentiate instruction. Understanding that really is about what the teacher knows in the developing category. So you think to yourself, this, this developing category, does the teacher know this information? Whether she's doing anything with it or not, does she know it? And if she knows it, yes. And you may not know if she knows it or not. That may, you may have to have a conversation. That post-observation conversation may have to give you the information for you to be able to check this descriptor, and that's okay. So any questions about this slide? And this may be something that you have all, that you've seen before, but I just included it as a review in case you haven't. And in case we have um, someone new on, it's always good to um, kind of give some perspective and some interpretation of the rubric. So yes, that's a great question. Your observation is not what you see in the classroom. It can be anywhere. Yes, during your observation time, it's what you, it's what I see and what I know about that teacher. What I see during that classroom and what I know about that teacher. Now to know something, remember that you really need evidence of it. You need to have had a conversation. You need to have seen her interacting. You need to have seen the data from it, product of it. To, you know, make sure that there's evidence. It can't be a feeling you have, uh, an opinion you have. It has to be um, a low inference piece of evidence for you to know it. And we'll talk a little bit more about that as we progress on. But yes, that's that's how I, I think about the observations and how you know what to mark, which of the descriptors to check, what I see 
and what I know. So next, I wanted to make sure that we had some clarification around marking the rubric during observations. And that question was the perfect leeway. This information can be found on page 34 of the process manual. The principal or observer will complete the rubric for evaluating North Carolina teachers during teaching teacher observations. A check in the first column labeled observation means the evaluator should be able to observe the items in the row during the routine observations. That's over here. So that means that this row of descriptors, I should be able to see those during a routine observation. It doesn't matter, but that's just some information for me to have. The observer checks descriptors observed during the lesson and considers evidence of additional performance responsibilities demonstrated by the teacher. And I am uh, taking this information directly from um, the manual. Let's see, on page 34. Observers should mark what they see and what they know. So for example, if I know this teacher plans her lessons based on numerous assessment data because she shared the data with me during a conversation we had earlier in the year, I can mark the descriptor stating evaluate student progress using a variety of assessment data. I didn't observe the teacher analyzing the data. However, based on our conversation and the data and the analysis she shared with me, I have evidence to mark the descriptor. Again, what I see and what I know. And so now let's look at the descriptor in the second column. Provides evidence of data-driven instruction throughout all classroom activities. This descriptor is not marked even though the descriptor in the third column is marked. The descriptors progress across the rubric most of the time, but marking the rubric does not have to progress across from right to left during the observation. Read the descriptors and mark all that are true for the teacher no progression order must be followed for marking the descriptors. The only time that a progression must be followed is at the end of the year when you are assigning element ratings and standard ratings. Procedures for collecting, teach, for collecting teacher practice data throughout the year on the observation rubric differ from those required at the time of the summary ratings are being determined. So when completing the observation rubric, disregard all labeling that applies to the summary rating evaluation process. This includes the column headings, developing proficient, accomplished, and distinguished, as well as the dot, 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 and notations. These are only relevant at the time that the summary rating occurs at the end of the school year. So when I told you that we had this multi-purpose multi rubric, that's where some of the confusion happened is because we used the same rubric, we had kind of have to take away some of the parts of it to best use it when we're using it for other parts. But this I pulled directly from our uh, manual. Also, check descriptors for actions that are observed during both the classroom observations and the observation cycle period. This includes all elements, not just those marked as visible during the observation. Again, that means things that you see and you know. And there's no obligation to a left to right progression within an element row. Check what you see and what you know to be true. Write detailed comments and feedback in the comment boxes and check additional element descriptors if the post-observation discussion and or artifacts warrants doing so. So after you have your post-observation conference or during your post-observation conference, it's okay for you to go back and to mark descriptors based on information that you 
have received during that post-observation conference? And that is a big question that I get a lot um, during this time of year. So just as a brief review, this year-long process is a series of formative assessments where data is collected on each of the observation rubrics. And at the end of the year, all of the data is considered, including how many times throughout the year each item on the rubric was noted. And this informs the end of the year summative evaluation. As a result of the observation, we have component six the most important part of the evaluation process, the post-observation conference. So let's go back to the slide from the beginning of the presentation when I emphasize the purpose of the evaluation is about growth and improvement. The post-observation conference is the heart of what we are working to accomplish, growth for teachers. The post-observation conference should focus on the evidence gathered during the observation Teachers should have an opportunity to reflect on the observation as it relates to the rubric. Observers should focus on providing relevant feedback on marked descriptors and how to grow forward for improved practice. The language of the rubric should be used to ensure an accurate interpretation of the standards. So also the post-observation conference is a crucial part of the evaluation process and the, because of the meeting between the teacher and the observer. This is a wonderful opportunity to strengthen that communication that results in a plan of continued improvement for the teacher's practice. So during each post-observation conference, the principal and the teacher should discuss and document their conversation from the rubric and how those strengths, how they can better build on those strengths and how they can improve those weaknesses of the teacher's performance for the next observed lesson. The post-observation conference should not include discussion of the ratings. The post-observation conference should only include discussion of teacher growth. So we have to remove the ratings from our post-observation conferences. We know that teachers are not rated. We know that, that we remove that from our, our conversations and we know that immediately that takes a stress level, that takes the stress level down for our teachers because the rating conversation is what really stresses or brings about a lot of stress to the teachers when it comes to their evaluation. And once we started understanding where so much of this stress was coming from is that feeling of being evaluated, you know, three or four different times during the school year, or in some cases, even if it's just two different times during the school year, that's too many. An evaluation, the evaluation process is a annual event and it happens at the end of the school year. The summary evaluation conference is the only time rating should be discussed. But what we know about those observations and those post-observation conferences is that we know that teachers want and deserve feedback. And what do we know regarding effective feedback? We know that feedback is not about the person giving it. We know that it's about the person receiving it. So that has to be the subject of our conversation. As administrators, if we feel ourselves having the conversation and the conversation subject is our story or our experiences, that's okay some if you are making a point, but the real conversation and the bulk of the conversation should be about the person receiving the feedback. Also, feedback is more effective the sooner it is given, and we talked about that earlier, and that's even a part of our policy. Feedback should be about the future. And that kind of, at, at one time when I was really wrapping my head around some of these thoughts, that felt a little bit like an oxymoron, that feedback was about the future, but it really is. The feedback that you are giving should be about the changes based on 
the past that you're going to make for the future. So also feedback is about behavior, not morale or attitude. And that is a delicate dance there um, because morale and attitude um, can have so much influence over behavior. And, and we'll talk more about that um, on another slide. And also feedback is a sign of strong leadership. And I dare say it requires bravery. So when providing feedback, um, it's crucial that we utilize evidences. So when we're utilizing evidences, um, our conversations should be about behaviors, not attitude or motivation. So really think about those observations, gathering that data, using the rubric, and watching behaviors. And um, just in your mind, maybe picture a, a teacher walking into the room and immediately her body language or attitude, it what it projects out. But you have to take that away. Take away the body language, the mood, whatever she's bringing into that classroom. Focus it more into the actual behaviors because of the attitude, motivation, or morale. That's the feedback that you would not that, that you would want to get. It's not you came into the room with what seemed like a negative attitude. It should be you came into the room um, and you slung your book onto your desk and abruptly turned around with your shoulders held back in a very defensive manner. I mean, and I'm just making this up as I'm talking to you all, but I think that you're, I hope that you're getting what I'm saying um, more in, in the second part of the slide, referencing low inference evidence, anything that you can see or hear, more factual, you want to remove your bias and interpretation. It's not, it should not be coming from you as your opinion or your interpretation. You're really wanting to provide feedback that um, is more factual, that can be grasped to more easily, especially if the feedback is critical feedback. So I think I have a question I want to see. The evidence should be about the lesson. The evidence should be about the lesson plan that they gave you and what you saw from the teacher. Anything you give should be able to be evidence. Okay, yes, I agree with you. Mm -hmm. Anything you give should be able to be evidenced based and not subjective. Yes, evidence based and not subjective. What I'm trying to see is facts and not how you feel. Yes, that's correct. And let's, okay, so let's go on. So let's take a pic, let's take a look at this picture. Um, so there's a lot that we can infer here. Um, so I just wanna give you 30 seconds for you to just take a look at some of the details in this picture. And I know this is, but you can pretend it's a live classroom. We've got a little snapshot in and let's just take a look. and maybe jot down on a piece of paper in front of you or take note of what are, um, what are some takeaways that you have here from, from this snapshot into this classroom? What can you say about this classroom? Let's go a little bit further than that. Let's see what, um, let's see if you can name some low inference evidence from this picture. What's some low inference evidence? And low inference evidence is anything you can see or hear. We obviously cannot hear, but anything that you can see that's factual, that removes your bias or interpretation. 
And if you want to put it in the chat, that would be great if you'll share it with everyone. Let's try that. Okay, I'm getting some great stuff. Teachers engaging and smiling. Class is very much participating. Student engagement. Teachers engaged and smiling. Okay. Okay, good. Okay. So, yes, there is a lot here that we could infer. We could say that the teacher in this picture is creative, energetic, and fun. Um, however, just, we don't know this for sure. It could be that the students in this picture just woke up from a nap or that they're taking and, and yes, they woke up from a nap and they're taking a stretch. And remember, the attitude and motivation don't matter in this regard. So creative, energetic and fun are describing the teacher's attitude or motivation. Um, I'm giving you just a 30 seconds of think time. So let's think about some of the things that we really can see. We can see that students have their arms raised, that the teacher is standing with the students, that the teacher is smiling and talking or maybe singing. Uh, the students are standing, appear to be mocking or imitating at, properly. There are posters on the wall. The chart paper is blank. Um, we could go as far to say, and these numbers may, may not be right, but it, low inference data would be, it, you know, at first glance, it looks like the class is um, following along with her direction, but really um, eight out of 12 students are following along her direction. That's low inference data. So we give them teachers feedback. Of course, you could be more creative than this. You could get closer up to the walls and see some of the tactile things she may have in the classroom, see some of the information she may have on the walls. I'm sure, you know, being there, you could gather a lot more uh, low inference evidence. Um, but when giving teachers feedback, use low inference evidence um, collected from the classroom observation or the campus interactions that you have with the teacher and align it to the bullets. Um, in the rubric. And so let's let's look at this just a little bit closer. Uh, I pulled here standard 1A and just looking at this piece of the rubric, uh, we see this last row of descriptors here. We see these would more than likely um, be witnessed in an observation. But what low inference classroom observation data should I be looking for with regards to standard one? So if I'm looking at this descriptor, establishes a safe and orderly classroom, what low inference data would I need to see to mark this descriptor? And so, and, um, teacher modeling desired behavior. I'm going back over to the chat because I'm going to actively engaged. Um, yes, and I'm not going to, your your responses are, are correct. I'm just, I'm saying that you're wanting, that I'm suggesting that you shift to more of a low inference data point for feedback, um, for better feedback. Um, and the comment, even if waking up from a nap, she is still involved with demonstrating what she wants her students to do. Mm -hmm. She's modeling. And in, in, if you can link that back to um, modeling, which would be an instructional strategy, and you have all that, and that's a conversation that you all can have, yes, yes, yes. I'm all for that. Students seated, participating. And rules on the board, yes. Okay. So, any any uh, other response? Any responses? Like, what would I want to see? And I'm going to go ahead because we're kind of wrapping up with our time. Some of the things I might see for low inference data in establishing a safe and orderly classroom may be um, how my um, 
my classroom is organized, how my seats are organized. Uh, I always use this opportunity when I have a chance in that a 21st century learning environment uh, simply cannot house some of the things that our veteran teachers um, keep. And I'm a veteran teacher myself, but in a classroom setting, I simply could not keep all the things that I may want to keep at my home that are important or um, have sentimental meaning to me. Our school buildings just uh, won't permit that. We don't have the space for that anymore. Our space has to be used differently now. So uh, establishing a safe and orderly classroom, what does that look like? And in the, the time of um, our pandemic, that certainly looks um, different in different schools. Uh, moving to the accomplished descriptor in that category creates a classroom culture that empowers students to collaborate. What would I need to see there? Um, if I go back to the chart that I showed you before, it would be about interaction in this category of descriptors. So seeing students interact with each other um, in a positive way, um, learning, where learning uh, is happening, seeing the teacher facilitate um, the empowerment of students to collaborate, and then empowers and encourages students to create and maintain a safe and supportive school and community environment, what do I need to see? And that's probably outside of the classroom walls, and even though that line of descriptors, um, it's noted as being a part of the observation, but what would I need to see? And that would be outside of the observation. So also moving on, I pulled 1D. Um, this is the part where our um, teachers justify their performance solely on the first line of the element. And I, I like to point this out the first line of the element up here. Um, teachers advocate for schools and students, and of course, and, and this is so difficult to have a conversation with uh, a teacher because our teachers do advocate for our students, and they're such, um, such fans and cheerleaders and hard workers for our students, and of course, think um, that they are accomplished or, dis or distinguished when it comes to being an advocate for the school and the students. Uh, and at a minimum proficient. Uh, they may think I defend our school, I'm an advocate, but if you look closely at the description in its entirety or the descriptor across the span of the rubric, you would need professional practice evidence, such as their participation in change of policy that affected student learning. A question that, it, um, that initiatives they have led to improve education would inform how you mark the rubric. So this is a this is a really good conversation to have here. Supports positive change of policies and practices affecting student learning. So to ask for evidence from a teacher for how they are supporting positive change of policies and practices affecting student learning, and they could be just by sharing their opinion with their leaders, by reaching out and um, being an an advocate when there is an opportunity for change. Uh, but having that conversation is important when marking this descriptor. Also, these are the NISIS questions that uses the language of the rubric. Um, and here is a link to those. And if you've not used these before, this is by far uh, one of the most used tools um, for administrators and observers, evaluators across the state. Uh, this is questions to um, for the post observation conference and summative evaluation, and they are um, vetted and cross referenced to uh, meet what the standards are really looking for. Uh, the professional teaching standards, and they are divided up into elements within the standards. Um, it's a front and back page, and there's the link. And then here's some upcoming webinars that we have. Um, on uh, at the beginning of March, and I just wanted to make sure you guys had this information. I'm sorry that um, we're just about to run out of time. Here is also within your presentation a link to the NESIS Google site where you can find um, tools and resources to support you and your use of NESIS. Here on the teacher's page, if you look over to the left side, there's COVID information. 
but on the teachers page everything that we looked at today including the teacher evaluation cycle requirements the pdp chart of course the evaluation process and some additional resources are all located here for you and at the top to the right is the questions document and over here is the manual and all the pages are set up the same way um, and just so you know updated covid support and information is located at the top of the navigation bar uh, there's a great recording here from robert Sox. Um, to review the use of the NESIS rubric to support educator professional and instructional practices and offer some conditional use when observing remote and blended learning. Um, it's a great um, recording to watch with your staff or to, to send out to your staff and then to maybe have a blog or some um, continued conversation. Thank you everyone for joining me today. If you have questions, please always reach out. I am here to support your work, your niece's work, in any way that I can. And I'll look forward to our time together again at another time. If y'all have a great evening. Uh, chat, okay? Oh, thank y'all. Thank you so much.